better idea of the type of work I do. Uh, I'm aware I'm not that interesting, so I'll make that a bit <laughs> short. Uh, and then we'll move into questions about the uh, murals. Um, so I'm an artist out of Flint. Uh, typically I work a lot more with oil paints and canvas. Really just in the last couple of years I started trying to do more murals just as opportunities came up. Uh, things like the art pad. It's been an interesting transition, um, really just how I approach each one, both conceptually and dealing with the different mediums. Uh, for me, murals are a lot more challenging because I'm less familiar with the medium, but at the same time, it presents a new opportunity to kind of engage the community. Um, I really just approach it a lot differently, considering what I want to say with that uh, more broad audience. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I definitely work figuratively, almost always, and I like to deal with a lot of naturalism, particularly with the portrait. Um, for me, I like the idea that I think portraits are perhaps the most complex things that people can recognize and understand. So it really gives you that opportunity to convey emotions and feelings um, that are universal. Uh, I like to compare it to like if I were to draw like a basket of fruit or something. Uh, if I got the stem a little off, or if I got one side of the apple a little off, you might not notice. But if I drew someone's face and their lip was all droopy, like everyone would know that that's not right. So I kind of like that. I like that the portrait is something that we're all so familiar with that uh, you really can, those subtleties don't get overlooked. Um, so I, I was interested in spray paint and murals from a pretty early age, I did a lot of graffiti in high school. I wasn't terribly good at it. So once I started kind of painting with oil painting, I, I dropped it for a long time. And really recently, I think twofold. For one, there's a growing interest in murals. Um, and then also what's available for mural artists is growing. You know, really in the last 10 years, what you can offer with just spray paint and different aerosol cans, the options you have, start to cater more towards that fine art. Um, when I was in high school, spray paint was a lot about being very opaque, really high pressured, um, and that lends itself to graffiti. So it's something that you can do really fast, it's something that's really high visible, they were oil based for a long time, harder to buff. Um, and now you see a lot of low pressure cans, a lot of things where uh, I probably couldn't attack a portrait in the same way five, ten years ago as I can today. Um, as in regards to aerosol. So, for me, my trajectory kind of went where, in high school, my dad started modeling um, at the community college in Flint. So I got exposed to kind of that studio setting, um, that university studio where they did a lot of figure drawing. And to me, that was my idea of like real art, of like a real artist, that really kind of led me to turn away from, well, really toned down how much I committed towards graffiti and street art. Um, and until recently with projects like this one, I didn't pick it back up. So some of my frustrations with murals kind of comes from that lack of experience, because I spent five years just not doing it. Um, there's a lot of advantages. Mural painting, to me, it lends itself a lot more to kind of that a la prima painting, where it happens very quickly. It's all at once, so that's nice, but it's nothing at all like my old. Um, my oil paintings, I do a lot with layers, even so much so I like accentuating the different uh, steps of the process, letting some of those things come through to the final product, which doesn't translate well to aerosol because it's so immediate, right? Those layers don't even exist. So in an oil painting, I might let some of the charcoal drawing come through, I might let some of the grisaille come through, and then I build up those glazed layers on top, um, none of which is even an option with aerosol paint. It's, uh, I like to say, like, for me, spray paint doesn't look good until it looks good. So all those other steps really don't translate the same as they would on a canvas. I like to think that with canvas painting, with oil painting, it's a lot more niche. You have more control of an audience. So the way I approach an oil painting is I like to first and foremost have that language of painting like, I want that motif to bring through. I want that to be the first thing that connects with the, the viewer. And then I deal with those social issues kind of in the subtext. So if we took this painting, for example, 
I would want first for it to be recognized as a Baroque painting. I'd want first for someone to realize that it is St. Cecilia. And then once we are in that space, we can drive the conversation more subtly towards whatever. You know, in this instance, it was the pandemic. Um, by contrast, I think when you deal with mural paintings, the audience is much more broad um, and it's much larger. So that voice has to be a lot louder. So for example, with this one, I, I put the mask on her face. Um, to me, in the canvas painting, that'd be kind of catchy. You know, I wouldn't really do that. But I think it is appropriate in this setting because it almost works backwards for me. The idea is that you need that attention getter, you need that conversation that is happening in the community right now. And then once we have that attention, we can steer what I like to think is I contribute kind of that language of painting um, afterwards, right? So it happens in reverse. So with these projects specifically, I know the George Floyd one kind of had quite a journey just being where it is now. For anyone who doesn't know, um, I contacted Katrina with the Lansing Art Gallery. I asked if we could do the George Floyd really once I just was aware of, you know, how big a, a moment we were in. I really wanted to contribute as much as I would like to contribute in other ways. I feel like the only thing I'm really good at is painting. Um, so my opportunity was to do a painting of George Floyd. Uh, hats off to the Lansing Art Gallery Katrina for throwing that together so fast. It happened in like four hours. I was like, hey, I want to do this painting. She was like, okay, let me see. And then like by the time I got out of work and was down here, I started it. So that was really cool. Um, I thought the first one came together pretty good. We were a little rushed. Me and the other artist uh, detached. He did the calligraphy. I'm not good at calligraphy. So for anyone who thinks I did that, I didn't. <laughs> I'm not, I don't mind when people think I can do stuff I can't. Like, uh, that's fine. You can all think I'm a really good calligrapher. Also. Um, but then, of course, that one got defaced. So we had first, as soon as I found out, it got defaced. So I was talking with Detach about, okay, do we want to, you know, when would you be able to come down and redo it? We talked with Katrina a little bit. And then immediately there was this outpouring from the community um, asking if we needed help, if we needed funds, what we would need to see again be done. And in my mind, that speaks a lot to really the opportunity that murals present, where because you put them in the public space, they really belong to the community once they're out there that the conversation then becomes about that dialogue between now no longer me and the audience, but really the community and the community. How do they feel about it? How do they respond to it? Um, so it's nice to know that they liked it and wanted me to redo it. Uh, it would behoove me if I thought that it was because I'm just so awesome and they like my art. I don't think people would care as much if this first one got vandalized. Um, but again, that's about capitalizing on that conversation or the opportunity for a conversation surrounding Black Lives Matter, surrounding George Floyd. Um, I think the fact that the public response was so strong and so immediate really does prove that the moment we were in was so um, potent. So immediately we received a lot of people wanting to reach out, to donate, to give funds, way more than what I needed. I mean, I was prepared to come out for free. I like getting paid, I don't, I'm not going to turn it down. Um, so it was really cool, we were able to, I guess, start allocating some of those funds towards future projects, which I think is a really good response. I mean, we can't stop someone from vandalizing it, um, but we can't control how we respond to it. And I like to think that them vandalizing it, opening the door to bring more art in the community, is really kind of poetic. If you think about it. That's a really good response. Like, not only did you not destroy this art, you allowed it us to and even further than conversation. Um, so, I don't know how much more you guys want to talk about me. I'm like six foot two. Uh, <laughs> um, so, we can open up for questions if anyone has any. What got destroyed? What's that? What got destroyed? The George Floyd mural was defaced um, a few weeks after we painted the original one. So because of the nature of spray paint, we couldn't fix it. We pretty much just had to roll it out and start over. Which, again, also worked out pretty good because we made it larger, added a few things. 
Um, it was really important with that one that I wanted to recognize the community that helped us. So that silhouette at the bottom of the protesters was kind of alluding to the fact that it was really a rallying from the community to help that mural go up the second time. We'll be back next year. That's up to them. I'll come back if they yes, want me to. Tough one. I don't know, going to engineering or something. <laughs> um, what I found over the last few years is that there's really two types of art in my mind. There's working art and then there's what I would consider more fine art. I'm not claiming that one is better than the other or one is more noble than the other, but I really think that as an artist you need to decide how much of each you want to do. Um, if you you know, great examples would be like Rembrandt or um, Judith Leister, who are really great portrait artists. They took on commissions, and they worked really well in that space. I mean, I know about them, so they did something right. Um, but you need to decide if that's the type of artist you want to be. Personally, I try to avoid working art as much as I can. So I really look for opportunities where I have a little more liberties, where I can try to interject some type of my own voice. Um, but that's hard because it's harder to make money. So you need to decide what you can afford, what you want to do, what your goals are. Um, yeah, that would be it. Where's the St. Cecilia mural? St. Cecilia is this first one. Um, and that's based off of a Baroque sculpture by Stefano Moderno. Um, I take a lot from the Baroque era really because I like that high contrast, I like the drama, especially for a mural, I think it's fitting because we're trying to bring that into a space to start a conversation. So as much as you can kind of play on people's emotions, the more of a reaction you get, I think the more powerful the piece can be. I don't know how successful I am, but that's, that's the goal. Um, what has been the greatest sacrifice you have made for your art? The greatest sacrifice for art? Um, well, I think Chuck Close said it pretty good, where he said, like, um, if you're waiting for inspiration, that's for amateurs. He said, like, the rest of us just get to work. So I think, <laughs> I think it's important to remember that it is work. You know, a lot of times people, they get into art because it's fun or it's interesting or they like it. If it's something you want to do or really progress at, you got to do it when you don't like it. You got to do it when you're tired. You got to do it when you work 70 hours. Otherwise, you're just not going to get any better. So I would say for me, it's just, uh, I guess, burning the midnight oil, neglecting my wife and kids. What new projects have you got going? Where, where will those be? Um, so for you guys, I know that we're in talks. We're trying to secure at least one, hopefully two more locations in Lansing. Um, I know that the gallery started partnering with Below the Stacks. I'm not sure how much of this I can dispose of. Okay. Um, what I really wanted to do was hopefully get a mural kind of away from downtown. Um, one of my priorities, I grew up in a pretty ghetto part of town. So when you live in that area, it took me a long time to be exposed to this type of art. Um, I like to try to break that. I like to think that there's got to be some kid growing up in my old neighborhood that would like to see some fine art. So as much as I can, on top of doing my own work, I really like to think of where it's going. Um, and that aligned with back to the stack, or below the stacks and the gallery too. So we're going to try to do one on the south side, right? Um, so that's our main priority now for Lansing. And I'm pretty excited about that. And then I should have another one going up in Flint. Um, it's funny because I always try to do oil painting first. If I had to pick one, I think I'm better at it and I like it more. But where we are now, there's such a demand for murals. I think the fact that I get, it's easier for me to do murals when I'm really not even good at it, just speaks to how much people want them right now. So, I got a couple of oil paintings.
Yeah, there's one guy, Isaiah Latimer. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, sure. So Marissa asked what in Flint, uh, as far as the art scene, has been really successful. You think you guys could maybe take note from? Um, I know that the Flint Public Art Project, this is their second year running. Um, it's been a huge blessing to my city and even artists, both locally, for giving them an opportunity to kind of share some spotlight, but also just bringing in other artists. Um, as someone who lives in Flint, I mean, I enjoyed the opportunity to do murals. I like having my artwork be seen, but it's really hard to learn how to paint murals without meeting other murals. You know, it's there really is no canon for it. You know, there's no, at least I didn't find one. There's, you know, no classes at university. So when you want to see, okay, well, how our top mural is painting, you have to actually meet them, which is really rare. So I would say, you know, the opportunity to connect your local artist with other muralists, seeing how other people do things, um, that was invaluable. What's your favorite mural that you've done and why? Uh, <laughs> so what's my favorite mural? That's kind of hard. Um, I think it depends on what your goal is. What are you looking at? So these two murals behind me, I think they're successful in different ways. I think the first one is a much better art piece. And I like being able to bring that art into the community. I think it's a better representation of the things that I try to do as an artist. That being said, most people just don't care that much about me or my art. So the George Floyd one, I think, was very successful and being able to reach the community, being able to spark that conversation. And I think the fact of like the response it got when it was vandalized is kind of proof of that. I think that's successful, that we were able to get such a, such a reaction. Um, which image do I like better? Maybe the first one. Which one do I think did its job better? Maybe the Georgia. Is art helping you make your living? Not at all. I don't I make like no money on it. I plunge all of my earnings into making art. No, I actually work for General Motors, which is interesting. Coming from Flint, it's a love hate relationship because they've done so much and then they did so much. Money. Uh, I'm conflicted about that on my own time. question is, how do I feel just about it being a spot for memorials? Um, I feel fortunate, kind of lucky. So I, I have to remember to be humble when I see things like that, really because it's, I'm not sure how much I'm responsible for it. Um, if I were to do, when, okay, let me back up. So, uh, when, say, Rihanna Taylor, or for me personally, I don't know, not Miles in If I were to do someone else, I could do as good of a job as I did under George Floyd, or it could mean as much to me. Once I made it, how it resonates in the city is really less of what I had to do. So I love the fact that people use it for that. You know, I, I feel very fortunate I was able to make something that has that effect on the community. But I think it's really the community that turned it into that. So as much as I appreciate that it's happened, um, I have to recognize that I maybe didn't do anything that special. It's really the moment we were in was special. I feel fortunate to be a part of it, um, but it's really the community. Um, I don't know if you've already touched on this, but um, when approaching a project, do you always extensively pre-plan it, or do you sometimes just, you're guided by your intuition and just inspiration? Just freestyle. I don't, even, I don't even look at the wall when I'm doing it. <laughs> um, it depends on the project. So, 
any artist knows you have a whole a whole sketchbook of ideas that you're gonna get to one day. So sometimes it works out that one of those ideas fits the project. And so it happens immediately. It's like, oh, we need X and X. And I was like, oh, I've been thinking about X and X for months. Other times it is a lot more labor on the front. So really before you start painting, you have to think. I try to consider the space it's gonna go into. I try to consider, okay, what am I trying to say to, this, to these people viewing it? In oil painting, that's a lot easier because your, your audience is much more controlled. I like to think like, I know a lot more what that conversation's gonna be. Whenever a piece of work enters into the public space, um, I have to a lot more act on faith that it will be received the way I thought it would be. Because you know. Would you consider going into public schools and plant in town showing kids your art? Um, Flint Public Schools don't have art anymore. Oh? Uh -huh. Yeah, there's no art classes, so that stinks. Um, I do try to reach out. I mean, without the framework of public schools. Um, but I do think one of the areas where I could perhaps make an impact is by sharing what I can with people who want to listen. Particularly urban youth. You know, I have a younger brother who's 17. So whenever I interact with one of his friends, or even just kids in the community, do take an interest in art, I try as much as I can to spend time nurturing that as much as I can. Um, not that I'm a great teacher, but if there ever is an opportunity, I try to capitalize on that. Did you find it difficult um, to work like with uh, so many people engaging with you while you were working, like specifically like the torch boy barrel in particular, like people were so excited to see it coming back, so they're stopping and talking with you. Um, so is it difficult when people talk to me? Yeah. Like yes and no. I would say in general, it does get distracting, especially on an area like this where there's so much traffic. I probably got stopped like a thousand times. <laughs> um, sometimes I just try to leave my headphones in and act like I can't hear the person. But I try not to be rude all the time. On the other hand, it does make you feel good when there's that immediate response. Or when you're painting something and someone wants to tell you that you know, they think it's good or they're that you're doing it. Or even when they tell you they think it's bad. It's nice to see, like I said, if my goal is to have that conversation, it is nice to see it unfolding in real time. So it's, it's not all bad. I like getting stopped sometimes. Um, what's your experience with painting like large scale? Do you enjoy that? What are like the difficulties of working bigger versus a smaller scale? Um, well, it, it goes both ways with both oil painting and I like working on a fairly large scale even in my oil paintings. I like staying around that 68 foot range. For me, I think it opens up a lot of opportunity to deal with spacing, as far as like where would the viewer engage this work. Um, and then as they come closer, the different areas that you want them to engage with. I think it just extends the conversation working on a large scale because they see it soon. Now with spray paint, the hard part is just, it's more labor intensive, right? If I double the size, I just double my work. Now I gotta get on the ladder and it's up and down. And I think where it becomes easier is really to hit fine details. So one of the, at least for me, the biggest challenges with just spray painting something is that you can only go so small. Like the paint only comes out as small as it does. So the larger you work, the more opportunity you have just by ratio to do smaller details. So sometimes it gets easier. Like I don't like doing a face smaller than three feet if it's on a wall. Where you know, in oil painting, I can go a lot smaller, but it just becomes more work. So it's a trade-off how hard I feel like trying, I guess. Do you have any upcoming projects you're particularly excited about? Um, I would say what I'm most excited about would definitely be that mural that we're going to do in Lansing. 
Hopefully I do good on it. We'll wait. We'll see. If it turns out good, then I was excited. Um, and I am working on a series for my oil painting. It's, it's just such a weird time because so many galleries are up in the air right now. Um, I guess that's one thing I do really enjoy about public art. Um, is that even in moments like this, that opportunity to do it is still there. Um, so I think we're all pretty lucky that that's the case.